the CC camps, and basically were of the ones of Dakota. However, Franklin Roosevelt, our president, in the first hundred days in office, brought together the young and the land. In 1933, the president signed a measure passed by Congress providing for energy conservation work in the nation's forests and parks. He appointed Robert Feshner, and we were blessed to have him out here. He's a prominent labor leader. He worked with the Department of Labor, War, Agriculture, Interior, and basically the Labor Department official. They selected and registered um, men the ages of 18 to 25 predominantly to uh, who had families on the public relief rolls. And the young men, when they signed up for the CCCs, they had to agree to, uh, they got $30 a month, but they had to send 25 of them home. A lot of them not only sent the 25 home, they sent the whole 30 home. Feshner charged the Army with the enormous burden of training, feeding, equipping, conditioning, housing, and transporting the men. The Department of Agriculture and Interior were assigned to oversee the special work project. project. And I left the other thing. Today, um, we have Otto from He's a volunteer. He can come up and tell you about himself. Um, he volunteers all over Mount Rushmore, Jewel Cave, and several different places. And he does programs for spe specific things like this. Um, we had a few mix-ups today, and we had to change out people. Peggy Sanders wasn't able to come. And we had actually two CCC men that uh, were going to come. and visit with us today, Jay and Stan, and both of them kind of got a little cold here at the end. So Otto and I are what you get. <laughs> <laughs> so Otto, if you would come up and tell them a little bit and, about and, yourself. And I'm getting a cold, so I'm going to take off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am a, a full-time volunteer, which Sometimes makes my wife happy, sometimes doesn't. But how I got interested in the CCC is pretty simple. We were doing a research project at Mount Rushmore. And we were researching the gentleman. If, you, if you've been to, to, to Mount Rushmore, there's a large plaque as you walk up the avenue. It has a list of 400, I think it's 398, but 400 names on that plaque that worked or contributed in some way to Mount Rushmore. And what we wanted to do, and we had in the, in the payroll records, reference to the CCC. So some of those workers worked for uh, Borglum on the uh, carving, and some of them worked for the CCC at different times, maybe worked for both, maybe only worked for one. And I was fortunate enough to go with the Park Service to Hayward, Iowa, and interview a CCC worker by the name of Whitey Iverson. And I believe that Whitey, who's now 93, and Nick Clifford, I don't know if any of you have heard the name Nick Clifford, but Nick is uh, the last, we believe, known worker, actually worked on the faces at Mount Rushmore. He's 93 as well. Uh, he sells a little book in the, in the gift store at, at Mount Rushmore. And last summer, Nick wanted to go to the top of, the, of, of Mount Rushmore one last time. He's 93 years old. So there was quite a bit of discussion with the Rangers as to whether they could make that happen. And Nick had a, uh, a young man that was a family friend. So we actually tethered Nick to this 22-year-old kid. And the Rangers would come behind and kind of shove Nick up the, up the mountain. And uh, one of the... Uh, Rangers interviewed him as we stopped, as we went up. It was a five and a half hour trek. But anyway, we got Nick to the top and we sat on Washington's head and had a nice chat up there. Off the subject from CCC, but that's how I got interested in the CCC. Um, and then I got to know Peggy Sanders, and I'm sorry Peggy isn't here today. She uh, possesses a lot more knowledge about the CCC than I ever will. 
and uh, she gave me a call, gosh, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, and asked me if I could fill in on a little short notice, but I arranged some things, and so I apologize, but here I am. And she asked me to play, uh, to show you just a few slides. Some of it is a repeat of what Peg just said, but I'm, I'm bound by contract to show that, uh, those slides. So I'll play those real quick, and, and then we'll move on. I can make this work. I don't know if we can we hit lights if we some of these slides were made available by the Civilian Conservation Corps Museum in Yale City, South Dakota, and Peggy Sanders. Here we see a picture of the museum in Hill City. If you've not been there, we certainly invite you to uh, visit. <coughs> In 1932, America was suffering from a terrible economic depression. Then President Hoover did not believe in government interfering with industry or business and did little to help the unemployment and the increasing numbers of the poor. In November of 1932, the election for President Hoover lost to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democratic candidate. During the election campaign, Roosevelt promised the American people a new deal. Roosevelt's government would create jobs for public works projects, and the poor were to be employed. Never before had the government played such an important part in the economy. Two days after Roosevelt's inauguration in March, on March 4, 1933, the new president called a meeting of the government officials to create a Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. The CCC was to place up to 500,000 unemployed youths to work in forests, parks, and rangelands. This tree army would be responsible for reforesting public lands, building roads, trails, bridges, and buildings in state and national parks and other public lands across America. <coughs> there were up to 300 different types of work projects which fell into nine classifications. Structural improvements, transportation, erosion control, flood control, forest culture and protection, rangeland culture and protection, recreation, wildlife, and miscellaneous. The first year, South Dakota was assigned 13 camps with a quota of 2,600 men. Construction of camps began, and the State Emergency Relief Commission began enrolling young men. The April 26, 1933 Rapid City Journal's headline read, First of the Forest Army to Fort Meade. The news article stated that 6,000 applications had been received. New recruits, 94 men, were sent to the only Army post in the state, Fort Meade, Sturgis, South Dakota, just 24 days after President Roosevelt had issued the executive order creating the Civilian Conservation Corps. The enrollees, single and between the ages of 18 and 25, could be conditioned and issued uniforms and job assignments. The first camp uh, was established at Estes. It's located on a site of an old logging camp. The site had a sawmill and it was located in the Black Hills, two miles south and one half mile west of the town of Nemo. Part of the program, as you recall, was uh, Recreation, and here we have a picture of the baseball team in their uniforms from that camp. During the next 41 days, 13 additional camps were established in South Dakota. That first year, word went out to the veterans of World War I that CCC applications would be accepted at U.S. Veterans Bureau offices during the month of June. Throughout the history of the South Dakota CCC, an average of 20% of those who served came from outside the state. Five more camps were formed in October, and none of them were manned by South Dakota boys. Two of the five camps were manned by veterans, and the other three were occupied by North Dakota enrollees. As the number of camps increased, recruits were sent directly to their assigned project. Of course, they got uniforms issued. They were supervised by members of the U.S. Army, U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, and the state of South Dakota park officials. The CCC recruits were enrolled, organized into companies, clothed, equipped, and conditioned to work in the field. Work included building camps, roads, bridges, dams, fire towers, 
along with firefighting and fire prevention. Hand tools and elbow grease were used in the backbreaking work. When we talk about backbreaking work, we have to mention the Hardy Peak Fire Tower. And if any of you have been up there, you know uh, it's quite a climb to get up there, and the uh, work would have had to have been extremely difficult. It was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps from 1935 to 1938. Stones gathered from French Creek were used to construct the tower. All of the building materials were hauled by man and mule along the three-mile trail to the summit of Harney Peak. Of course, these men were not without the comforts of home, and there probably would be some disagreement as to uh, how comfortable this would have been. Here we show a picture of an outdoor shower at Company 789 Pactola in 1933. And of course, there was also the opportunity to get uh, fresh milk. A little fishing at Center Lake. Robert Fechner was the director of the Civilian Conservation Corps. He strongly supported and encouraged education for the young men in the camps. He felt that the CCC, beside improving our natural resources, had a responsibility to teach the boys how to work and do a good job. He encouraged them to take pride in their accomplishments. He approved the employment in each camp of eight or ten LEMs, local experienced men. These were older, unemployed craftsmen who could guide the boys in doing skilled work, such as carpentry, masonry, and the like. Here's a certificate that was issued to William Foley, uh, CCC Company 1793 in Custer, and it gives the uh, commander and uh, so on. This uh, appears to be a duplicate certificate. Uh, it happens to have WPA administration on the top, but it also references Mr. Foley and the 1793 uh, uh, camp number, company number from Custer. And he completed 84 hours uh, in auto mechanics. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this short presentation of the CCC. Again, we invite you to visit the museum in Hill City. Technology is a wonderful thing, huh? <laughs> we can turn the lights back on if you want to. Uh, and, and I referenced the, the uh, Harney Peak, and this was the, the point in the program where we were going to talk to Stan Hawthorne. Stan actually worked uh, at Harney Peak, and uh, that had to have been just horrendously back-breaking work. Uh, some of the discussions that I have, these uh, they made, um, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard it from enough people, so I think it probably is, they made uh, carts out of uh, old wheels and cut 50-gallon barrels in half and they would hitch those up to mules. And that's how they would haul equipment and, and stone up to the top of Harney Peak. I don't know how many of you have been to Harney Peak, but that's quite a hike, quite a hike. And to be uh, building that thing must have been, been just, just something. Um, like I say, this is the point where, where Jay or Stan were gonna talk. I will try to answer some questions for you if you have any. I've been to um, many of the local CCC camps and most of the ones East River that, that I know of. Like there's like uh, 42 or 44 total. I don't know the number off the top of my head. You may be no big. I, I don't know the number exactly. But I've been to a number of them. There's remnants of some of them yet. Uh, uh, foundations and the like. There was a side camp at um, Hell Canyon, which is uh, west of Jewel Cave, if any of you know where that is. It has quite a long hike if you go up on top of the hill and come back down. But if you walk straight in, you can see there's a, an old, uh, what appears to be an old foundation of some kind, and there's some old, some old uh, uh, iron and so on in there that I don't know is from the CCC, but I think it is. Um, so if you ever get a chance, it's kind of a nice afternoon hike in there, and there's of course, other areas around uh, around the Black Hills. Anybody have any questions that I can try to answer? Yes, ma'am. Well, I've actually got two. Um, I heard, you know, years and years ago, and I'm originally from Minnesota, so my mother's family's from Minnesota, that one of my 
at least one of my uncles was with the WPA. Now, what's the difference between the work projects and the CCC? You want to answer that? No. Did you know Jim? Jim? No. Well, uh, the WPA was, it was uh, not organized as a military group like the CCCs. And they, just the local men, they were hired on local projects uh, as projects existed, like building schools, uh, sidewalks, uh, uh, different things in the various towns. And I think most every town of any size in the state had a WPA project going during that time. Also, they did arts and crafts. That was a neat deal. And, and uh, uh, I got in on one of them. They did, they did plays and musicals. And uh, that was a WPA project uh, in these towns. And, and maybe uh, uh, some of the people here, like myself, uh, got in on those, or were at least the beneficiary of some of the projects. We had, uh, speaking of the WPA, I, I, I thanks to Jim, I mean, it's Jim Applin, the man is, and his wife Peg are, they've got more information at their fingertips than I will ever have. Uh, my my uh, uh, niece and her husband were out last year, we actually climbed to the top of, of Hardy Peak, and along the way we were talking about the CCC, and my, my nephew said, you know, there's a, there's a CCC project right on, on my dad's farm. And he, we're all from East River, South Dakota. And I said, I don't think CCC was down there. And he said, yeah, I'm gonna send you a picture. And he sent me a picture and it was actually, it actually was the WPA that built the dam on this farm that, uh, that we're talking about. So it, that's correct. The WPA did a lot of local projects. The uh, one, and this is just a, uh, what you hear from, from talking to folks. When World War II started, a lot of the CCC folks had already been under that military type organization because a lot of these camps were run by military. And so when World War II took off, a lot of these men were already prepared. They knew how to take orders, they knew how to work, they were uh, in shape. And so it, it's, it's been said, and I have no reason not to believe it, that they contributed to, to the war effort in a big way and, and, and helped to win that war. <coughs> They did a lot of other little things too. They weren't exactly little things, uh, but like learning how to work with the steel and the metal, how to make things and stuff like that. So they were prepared for war. The other things, they were prepared for personal things. Um, they have a Native American man that's in the program up there at Hill City. And he did, all he did was cut hair cuts. For 25 cents, he cut hair. And so by the time he went through thousands of men on a regular basis, he came out and went to barber school. And uh, um, they had many things like that. Um, talking about Harney, there's one place in the program or something I've read where they had wheelbarrows where they take stuff on uh, boards up there to get it up there. And the bad part was, if you lost a wheelbarrow over the side, you had to go get it and straighten it out because you still <laughs> needed to use it in that. Uh, they also had men that became uh, seamstress in that, to getting the clothes fitted and repairing, patching some of the things. They had a lot of they weren't necessarily forestry or masonry projects. They taught them how to live, how to work, and they kept them busy. And uh, Saturday night came and the men all jumped on a truck and they tried to go to town. They did plays, they did dances, they drank a little beer, and uh, they just had a good time. And uh, so if you really get a chance uh, you need to go up to Hill City and stop it just as you go into town there and that and go in the office and ask that lady to put on the big film. It's right there. Um, I have two teenage boys and they're always interested in this 
stuff. And when it said that people were on a relief program, well, what's a relief program? Well, that's social services or welfare or something like that. Well, by the end of going through the film and going upstairs and looking at all the photographs and reading newspaper articles and stuff like that, the boy said, oh, they gave him a job. And there was, there was pride in being in the CCCs or the WPA. If you had a project, you completed it, it was something that was needed in the community, and it did definitely give back pride. And there, there were, uh, there were 23,000 some, I don't know the exact number, I don't know if anybody does, uh, uh, folks just in the CCC in South Dakota. So that would give you an idea uh, nationwide of how many participated in the, in the CCC. It hit, regardless of what your um, political persuasion is, it touched the lives of uh, a lot of men, a lot of families. Um, there's a lot of debate as to you know, what would have happened had they not you know, created the CCC. Well, I don't know, but I know, uh, I, I was telling Peg earlier, my dad was 72 when I was born. So he had a good recollection of the, uh, uh, those periods of time in the Depression because he, it affected him directly. Uh, so I know for the people that were in the program, it made a tremendous difference in their lives. It was a difference between food on the table and not food on the table in a lot of cases. So uh, I think it, it played an enormous role particularly in that point of time in our history. Peg, anything that you... No, and, yeah. and like I mentioned earlier, the boys did get $30. And they were supposed to send 25 of it home. And many of them would send all of it home, the $30 home. Then they would get a letter back, and they would get maybe a dollar. And so they have a lot of things like that up there at Hill City and that because they basically had everything taken care of themselves mm -hmm. but they knew their family uh, was at home and probably their parents and brothers and sisters even at that age and that and so they were providing for them. There were a few, a few that fought. It says uh, everything that you read. It's 18, 18 years old was the youngest. But I know in interviewing uh, a few folks that, that uh, a lot of them, not a lot, but I will say some fudged that a little bit. There were some 16, 17 year olds that needed to help their families back home, so they would fudge their age a little bit. How how they did that, I'm not sure. Maybe just let them in anyway. But uh, so there were some really, really young. Uh, and and uh, on the flip side, I, th I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there were f uh, 55, 56 year olds that, that would get in too that needed to, to help out uh, back home. So it, it uh, affected quite a, quite a, a, a large span of, of uh, age span of people. The younger men, their mother might even come in and sign and say they were 18 when they were 15 or 16. On that. And many men, even in our military, fudged about their age when they got in. And some of them fudged so they could go back to the Second War. And so that was pretty typical. Uh, one thing, too, some of the camps up here, um, I don't know how to say this, were kind of divided because they had one unit over here just for Native American or colored people. So we had a number, quite a number, of Native American that were at our CCC camps. And uh, they might be the potato peelers and they might scrub the floors until they got to move up and that, but they served and they just became part of it and they became brothers. They, they played uh, the, uh, and I can't remember the, the name of the, uh, the uh, Native American division. Uh, we visited the, the Farm Island 
CCC location, and that's just outside of Pier, Pier, South Dakota. And um, there was quite a, a close-knit local community there. And, and I, I'm not speaking out of turn. This is actually on their on their display and on their placards there. The the first, I believe it was, it was either the first or the second crew that came in were were native, and the locals got upset about that. So they asked them to leave, and the next group of people that came in, and I believe I'm getting this right, and my wife was with me, she'll correct me, um, as she that. does quite often, yeah. um, a number of things, but it's a different story. I got the camera. Uh, just they brought in a, a large group of German, I believe it was, German uh, ancestry, and the locals didn't like the Germans. <laughs> So they made the Germans move out and then brought in people that were acceptable to the locals. So there was a lot of politics and a lot of uh, racism, I suppose you could say, uh, in that era. And, and uh, I always found that quite interesting. They didn't like what they were doing, so they got somebody else in. Exactly. Especially sometimes it worked out that the project was almost done before they figured out they didn't like it. <laughs> Any other suggestion? Well, I just came back from Ireland, and they sort of had the same type of thing. They had welfare relief walls, where um, those that were on the welfare rolls were told, you know, put out the teams, and they just built the stone walls that you see all over in Ireland, and. What our guide said is sometimes there was no reason for building those walls except to give these individuals something to do. So I have to say our program was a lot better because they were doing something needed and contributing to the community. They did. They, they uh, cleared a lot of roads, cleared a lot of brush, planted a lot of trees. Um, just an incredible amount of work. I know in Colorado they had created a lot of trails in the national parks there. Yeah. So. Well, I, but the CCCs here in South Dakota, they actually had a lot of training that the men could take on with them, metal works and stuff like that. The, uh, the, in the Black Hills, there are no natural lakes. On many of the lakes that are in the Black Hills, the, the dams were built by the CCC. And I, I was mistaken in this, and I, I don't remember who corrected me, but I, uh, Pactola was not built by the CCC. It was built after that, I think, uh, in the 50s, if I remember right. So I had that, that mixed up, but it's a, a man-made lake. Uh, but like um, Center Lake and Stockade Lake, those were all, and Sheridan, uh, Sheridan Lake, um, those dams were all built by CCC boys. I, uh, I worked for a guy with, uh, who was one of the officers, and he told about uh, camp discipline, and they used uh, kind of army regulations. But one of the things, if somebody was caught stealing, he was either expelled, or if he wanted to stay in, he had to go through what's known as the belt line. The belt line is you get on your hands and knees, and the guys spread their legs and about four feet apart and maybe there was a hundred of them and you crawled the length of that and he said boy some of it was very really, the guys were really laid on and wow. he said it was it was a terrible thing but they didn't steal again. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else folks? These uh, camps there's still camps in the Black Hills that they still run kind of like the CC the, the only, the last, uh, well, they say it's intact, but a lot of the buildings, or some of the buildings at least, have been removed. The, the Black Hills Playhouse, I don't know if you've heard of the Black Hills Playhouse, is the last, it's, at least this is what it says on their waypoint sign, it is the last intact CCC camp. Now, they've removed some buildings. In fact, we were out there a year or so ago, and they were in the process of, carrying one of the old barracks down, and I guess it was so far gone that they couldn't do anything with it. There's also the, the Custer Camp, which is, uh, well, let's see, if you go south of um, 
crazy horse, first corner, I think, take a right, it's like two or three, I don't know if you've been back there, Peg, to the, to the Custer camp. Um, the, there's a couple of those cabins yet are, are uh, buildings from the, from the CCC. In fact, in, in, if, if Peggy were here, she'd be uh, telling you to look at, I don't remember the page, but in one of her books, she's got a picture of the uh, beautiful fireplace that's left in one of those cabins. Uh, so There is a couple of books. Peggy has one on the, Peggy Sanders has an Arcadia book on the CCC camp, and the other one is Men of Trees. On oh, what? Okay. They're both on the CCC camp. So you said the other one was on ministry or something? No, it's called Men of Trees. Oh, oh, Men of yeah. Trees. It's a, it's a green book. I started to ask about Valhalla. Wasn't that one of the original buildings? What's that? Valhalla in the in Custer State Park. Does anybody know? That could be right. Uh, do, you, do you know the answer to that? I don't know. Um, I'm going to run and see if that museum there by the uh, uh, well, thing was one of them. It was one of the original buildings. They built that building. It was a museum there across from uh, <coughs> the main thing. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the, the Normex Center? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That, that could be. That could be oh. so. Could be so. I, I, I've, uh, I've just been learning about this in the last, I think, the, the, the camp down by the Chester, the camp on Marshall, the CCC with the boxes yeah. stuff on the road. Okay. That could, and the one was actually a CC camp, but it was built by CC people. A project of theirs, yeah. probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Fr uh, the French Creek Camp oh. and uh, the other one. That would Largely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I have another question. I live about 15 or 20 miles east of here, and we have a dam on our project that was only, the land was owned by my grandfather at the time. And it was always, ever since I can remember, it was always called the CCC dam. It was built by CC people back in the 30s. Yeah. And then I was wondering where a person could go to get more history on that. Well, or uh, if that was actually the truth, or was it a well, a lot of the, well, I wouldn't say all of them, but a lot of the WPA projects, from what I have learned, they always had a little cast iron or an iron, uh, uh, I don't want to say plaque, but that's not the right word, but with the, with the year WPA on it. Uh, as far as researching it, actually, Peggy, Peggy Sanders is going to be as good a, a reference as anybody. I mean, she's done ex extensive work. And actually, this gentleman, Jay Hendrickson, I don't know if you know, if you know Jay? Jay has, I visited with Jay for quite a long time here a week or two ago, and he's got so much information, it's unbelievable. He, he lives in, uh, in, in, um, in Hill City and was in the CCC. In fact, Jay uh, was instrumental in getting the little museum in Hill City. So uh, if you want information, Jay or Peggy or Peggy's got a couple of books this, here. This is Peggy Sanders' book, the Arcadia book, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and that. And it, the other one was the trio <coughs> and that. But Peggy has taken local photographs and put captions under them. And there's a lot of history. Um, I'll lay these two back there. And I'm sorry, we've kind of gotten a muck because Peggy was going to be here today, and then Tuesday we found out she couldn't come. And then we had the two elderly men, and they were going to speak today and answer questions and tell you about their time in the CCC, and both of them did not feel well. So, like I said, I, I apologize in that. But uh, you can look at these two books, and they will give you some ideas in that. And then do go up to Hill City. That museum is really awesome for being so tiny, and 
you go upstairs into a room and they just have a lot of blown up photographs and articles and stuff like that. And you can spend hours up there reading. They have a, uh, a database up there and I've been trying to get permission to post the list online and have yet to make that happen. But there's a list there that they have just on a little spreadsheet of the 23,000 some odd names that served in South Dakota. And you just have to scroll to it to see if you can find if there's a relative or, or a, a acquaintance that you know about that was in the CCC. And it's pretty interesting. The first time I looked at it, I recognized uh, two or three names right off the bat, and we discovered uh, some relatives of my wife's on the list as well, too. So in some small way or big way, uh, the CCC has uh, touched a lot of us. So, uh, yes, sir. Um, my, my name is Dale Ferguson. I'm a little brother of Wes. Yes. And my father served in the CCC right here in this camp. This camp. Is that right? Yes. Is, is, is Fetner? Earl. Earl Ferguson. Earl Ferguson. Wow. And he went up and they, what they did is they got uh, a double-bladed axe issued to, to him in anyway. life. Big, big double-bladed double head axe. Same thing way about the time. <laughs> and they turned them up, loosened them woods, and they just cut down trees. And, wow. Know, that's what he did. He, he works in the timber. See, that, that, that was work in those days. Mm -hmm. that, that was. And he, and he, but he joined right here. Wow. In this. Are you are you are you from this area? Yeah, yeah. I, we're both from here. Okay. My uh, our, well, our dad was uh, actually he he carried the mail from Sturgis to Hereford and back to the post office at Fort Meade. Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> so it was it was interesting to talk to him. I got a picture of him about this big, and it's of the whole Fort Meade group of. CC members in this one picture. Wow. And I would like to have you bring that in. <coughs> yeah. About it. We'll try and find it, but he's on the right, right at the bottom left, about two rows back. We <coughs> were looking at one day, and I, there was our father. Wow. How neat. You should have a copy of that. That's that's what I'd like to put a copy of we'll the file. I, I didn't know he had it, but we'll get it. Okay. How, I mean, did they sign up for a particular amount of time, or did they work for for as long well, as they wanted, or what? I mean, they could they could be up if I understand. They signed up until they were certified, uh, and then they got this little diploma thing, and that at that time you could advance. So, like, if you were here doing one thing, then you could advance to like bridge making or you could advance to uh, making houses. You were no longer a woodsman and that. And they had different, a whole lot of different um, degrees that you could work towards or become. And then, you know, um, it was just every program had four or five levels. And then when you got to this level, you were supervising these guys again. I, I noticed in some of my research that the, uh, the names would be listed in different years under different camps, different locations. So I don't know if they, if they moved around by themselves or if they, as Peggy said, uh, if they had Vance got different training and then were moved where they were needed. I'm not quite, that's still a little unclear to me, but I, I noticed that a lot of, and there might be, there might be a year, there might be a gap between uh, one year that they served. And, and some of those, and I'd have to look if they were locals, but, but remember a lot of these, or at least the ones in South Dakota, were farm kids. So if there was work back home, they may come out for one session, correct me if I'm wrong, come out so. for, for one one year or one term, whatever that might be, go back, work on the farm, and then apply and come back out, is, is my assumption. So, but it, uh, a lot of them served in several different camps. And I, I think the camps actually had 
you know, different layers in them. And that, and so if you became a supervisor, I never could figure out a difference in pay. But there definitely was a difference the, in what you did. The, the, and here again, I, I don't, it's unclear to me too, but I've heard from, from 25 to 35 dollars was kind of a, yeah. you, you might start out at 25, but depending on what you did, you could work up to 35, which, you know, nobody mm -hmm. got rich, but, and then most of that, as you said earlier, would go back home. Yeah. And that was mandatory when you signed yeah. up. Yeah. Is it possible that you would be the cab here? And if you wanted to learn something, that maybe that was taught in another camp and you were sent there? That's very possible. I don't know the exact answer to that, but uh, that's very possible that, that they would go to another camp to learn a different skill or to, to, to work in a different area. Well, it was run like the military, not just the military does today. That's right. You go to basic training, you move up, and you're, you're assigned to different places where they need you. They actually wore military. Uh-huh. Sounds like it was more of a training program. You know, instead of sending them off to college because they couldn't afford it, they sent them there to run a trade. Mm -hmm. Up at the Hill City, like the bed and stuff there is made out of patches of the the green, gray army wool stuff. And that and it's just the neatest old blankets and stuff where they had put them together from stuff that wasn't usable anymore and it became a blanket for the things. But yes, they did. They moved them around and sometimes I almost got it with what the job required. You know, if they were doing a bigger project, they'd move them up there. Masonry was a really um, desirable thing to get to that and be able to do that. And uh, because it was kind of like most people could chop down a tree, but when it got to laying in the masonry and doing fireplaces and stuff like that, that was, that was quite something. Mm -hmm. It seemed like they were the more desirable people. They had more benefits. I, I live out here and um, was told that, okay, my directions aren't any good, but out, out there, um, you, there still is the chimney place, uh, the, the fireplace and the chimney and that the was. So it's... Right over at the camp, right at the camp. Yeah, and that's all that's left there, but there is something here on the Fort, Fort Meade campus type. It's, well, over where it originally was, yeah. Uh, on the as you come in, you just would turn to the right. Yeah, the yeah. Goes to the south back. at the entrance. Uh huh. That's it. You ran to the footings of the CCC camp. Okay. In fact, we're doing vlogs there when we're done, and if anybody wants to follow us, they're more than welcome. And I think that big map that's right as you come in the door downstairs does also show that exactly where it's located. It was built just like an army base, actually. It was barracks. When, uh, I can't remember who came to see us a couple of years ago. Anyhow, he goes around and inspects and checks out VA hospitals. And uh, we were down to Piedmont for the state supper that night. And this big official came in. In that, and he was just so delighted with Fort Meade because we still have the parade ground, we mm -hmm. still have a lot of the original buildings, we have something here. He said, So many places when you start getting further back east is just a sterile hospital building. And so he said, You know, this history was so important and precious to preserve. That's all I have, unless anybody has any other questions. There's cookies and uh, pop and coffee back there. We 
We appreciate you all taking the time today to come.